We rest in you, Holy Spirit. We love you. We thank you. This is not just a spirit-filled church. This is a spirit-empowered church. It's a spirit-equipped church. You give birth. You sustain. You finish what you started. Does everybody here have an assignment in your life? You have an assignment, like something you believe is from God, whether it's family, a business, a ministry, a friend, whatever it is, like, you know, this assignment was from God, right? Will we all have that? Okay, so let's hold that assignment in the air right now. Lord, we thank you for the assignment. Because if it comes from you, it's good, even if it's hard. This room is filled with ministry leaders and parents and people in the city. Some lead nonprofits. Some lead families. Some lead within the confines of our church or the structure of our church building. Others, they lead and represent the kingdom work that's happening out in the city, Lord. So I thank you, and I honor them. It's difficult work, what you've called us to. It's super difficult. It's hard to stay in ministry in season and out of season to preach the word and remain faithful to the call. It is difficult, Lord. So today I ask for a fresh wind of the Spirit on our leaders and on our people. It blesses my heart to see, I don't know, 100 people out tonight just to be equipped. It's a beautiful thing. So just thank you guys, number one, for coming. And number two, Holy Spirit, would you meet us? We've come for you. I felt strongly the last four or five hours I was in prayer. I felt strongly the Holy Spirit told me to come and clear the air. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, and we're going to talk a little more about this, but it says the devil is the prince of the power of the air, right? So, like, there's stuff that we pick up in the air, like from relationships and stuff. Um, Sometimes, I just want to make sure I remember exactly what he told me in prayer, Um, I'm going to call out five things. Is there anybody here who you've, you've had an offense in your life? Or maybe you've been around somebody who's been offended or whatever, but it's affected you. I, like right now, like, can we just be vulnerable? We're a room of leaders and people that trust each other. Like, has someone's offense or an offense within you, has it, has it affected you at all? I'm the only person who's ever offended? Okay, yeah. Get real. Get a life right now. My goodness. This is, uh, today right now, we are going to break the power of offense. So right now, I'm going to say in the name of Jesus, we cast down every thought that would raise itself up against the knowledge of God. This isn't a preaching moment. It's not a communicating, motivational thing. Right now, we're actually in the spirit realm, casting down lies and offense. There's no room for it at our church. There's no room for it in our church and our people. So, Lord, we clear the air of offense right now in Jesus' name. We're going to talk about forgiveness in a little bit, but we clear the air of offense. We forgive our worst enemies tonight. Who you guys are like, I don't I don't know. They don't vote the way I vote. Forgive them anyways. They were hurt, and I'm mad for them. Forgive anyways. There's two people that you're called to be released from. It's those who hold you captive, and then those that it's so it's you're held captive because of what someone else is doing. And what's the other one? You're in there's one part of captivity that's from someone else, and another part of captivity comes from your own choices, right? Like, so whether it's your mistake or someone else's mistake, we're just going to forgive and move on and set ourselves free from it. Does that make sense? I could say that better if I was prepared, but uh, second thing, right now, we're, thank you. Thank you. I need that tonight. Thank you. This is so good. We want to pull out a root of bitterness tonight. We, we want to pull it out. So right now, we're just, we say in the name of Jesus, we pull out the dark root of bitterness. The Bible says it defiles many. And so we pull out a root of bitterness from the church body. May it be uprooted like a tree. 
may it just be picked up by the hand of God, root and stem. Leave no remaining remnant of this bitterness. In Jesus' name, we cast down resentment. The next two, we cast down unforgiveness. We cast down fear. Everything that would raise itself up against the knowledge of God right now, we cast it down. We clear the air. We want to unfollow those spirits. We're not going to be influenced by their voice anymore. We're not going to give ourselves over to their opinions. We're not going to build on yesterday's trauma anymore. Yesterday's pain anymore. We're going to move in forgiving people who have hurt us. So Holy Spirit, tonight we begin this teaching with a clear mind. We replace all those lies with the truth that Jesus loves us. And he has a plan for us. And he has good things in store for us. That he's going to take care of our family. That we've been adopted as sons and daughters. And even if we have differences with people, it's okay. We can move on and we can love each other and honor one another in spite of it. So, Lord, thank you for what you've done. We rip all that out. We cast all that down and we replace it with the truth of the gospel tonight. Now, Lord, send peace. Say, Holy Spirit, send peace. Just for me, because I, I want to know, um, how many of you have felt the releasing from something? Two, three, a few of you, several of you. It's good. Did you feel the peace of God come? It's interesting how that happens when you just release it. I'm going to choose to let it go, and I'm going to fight this battle with spiritual weapons. So, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to press in and grow in our relationship with you. Guide this night, grab a hold of everything that's said and done. Equip us, Lord, to become more like your son. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Say hello to someone around you while I get settled. I'm going to come down and we're going to do a little teaching. It's really a blessing to me that you guys are all here willing to receive from me. I don't take that for granted. Thank you. Um, I know there's so many things you could be doing with your Thursday night. I drove by Cemetery Park, and there was, like, the coolest community hang over there and, like, people watching the sunset. And it was just, like, this city is beautiful. There's so much to do. I don't take it lightly that you choose to be here, right? Um, it will be worth it. Hopefully. You want some church jokes? All right. Uh, so I'm getting longer jokes. I found a, a source for longer jokes, so it's not just dad jokes. Um, a little girl was attending a wedding for the first time. She leaned over to her mother and asked, why is the bride wearing white? Her mother replied, because white is the color of happiness, and today is the happiest day of her life. The little girl thought for a moment and then replied, so then why is the groom wearing black? <laughs> um, this one's old. I'm going to, listen, I realize I'm too young to have humor like this. I know that. Like, this is, this is another season in life, but I'm, like, withdrawing on future humor for me. You know, uh, I've heard this from someone. I don't know where I got it from, but I heard it from someone. A pastor was walking down the street when he saw a little boy trying to sell a lawnmower. The pastor asked, why are you selling this lawnmower? The boy replied, well, I'm trying to save up to buy a bicycle. The pastor thought for a minute and said, tell you what, why don't I just trade you my bicycle for your lawnmower? The boy thought it over and agreed. The pastor hopped on the bike and started, um, the, the pastor hopped on the bike and started to pedal away, but the bike wobbled. He came back to the boy and said, I can't seem to get this bike going. The boy replied, that's because you have to cuss at it. The pastor said, I'm a pastor. I don't cuss. 
I haven't cussed in years. The boy grinned. Well, just keep pedaling and it'll come back to you. <laughs> uh, this one... Um, this one might be my favorite. I had four. Um, a preacher was completing a sermon on prayer and asked the congregation, how many of you would like to go to heaven? Everyone raised their hand except one man in the front row. The preacher was surprised and went and asked the man after the service. He said, sir, don't you want to go to heaven when you die? The man replied, oh, when I die, for sure. I thought you were going to get a group to go there now. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, do you want the last one? No, I won't have a joke for Sunday. I'm on a roll, right? All right, I'm on a roll. I got the youth teams here. This could get rowdy. Here we go. All right. Um, during the church service, the pastor noticed a small boy who was staring up at a large plaque on the wall. It was covered with the names with names and small American flags. The boy had been staring at the plaque for some time, and so the pastor walked over and said, what are you looking at, son? The boy still staring, said, what is this? The pastor replied, it's a memorial to all the young men and women who have died in the service. The boy's eyes got wide, and he asked, which service, morning or evening? <laughs> yeah. yeah, there you go. That was the best one. All right. We really did this on a Thursday because I really wanted the youth teams and leaders here. It was important for me because... Um, I do think as we grow as a ministry, um, I don't want to talk too much vision tonight because I want to keep it teaching, but as we grow as a ministry, it's becoming more and more important that we have strong biblical foundation for teaching and discipleship in our ministry. Um, and the way I operate personally as a leader, it's like I don't like to do things just to do things. You, know, you start doing things out of obligation and you know, we uh, did one of these in June, and it was incredible. I thought, like, I, I studied so hard for that, and it was a, it was a, an equipping night on prayer. You can go back. I felt like there was some definitely some good content scripturally for everybody, but got busy this summer, and just life happened, and I kind of just, wait, Holy Spirit, when do you want to do another one? What What's next? And then finally, um, you know, just the last month or so, it started to stir again. He said, Here's the topic. And it was interesting because I was feeling like we're supposed to talk about community life and uh, just get into some healthy biblical confrontation stuff and how to approach problems, which we'll talk about some of that. But the more and more I went into prayer and the more and more the revelation was coming, I felt like we're supposed to talk about discerning spirits. And so um, we're going to do a little bit of all of it. So we're going to talk about four different things if we can get to the fourth I want to first lay a foundation for equipping. Then we're going to talk about discerning spirits. And then we're going to talk about the ministry of reconciliation and healthy confrontation and communication, if we can get to it. And I don't know. Part of me was like, maybe you just keep going at it until you accomplish what God wants us to accomplish in the people. And I don't know. At some point, we got to go home. Um, but yeah, let's just pray. And we'll get into it. Lord, thank you for your word. Your word is alive. The Bible says the word is inspired by God and it's able to equip us. It, we have everything we need through the word. So, Lord, as we go through a ton of scripture tonight, would you give us the grace to make it, to teach it, to apply it? and to activate in the church. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, why equipping? I don't know that we fully understand what equipping in the body of Christ is. I just want to read some scriptures. We're going to get into it. But Hebrews 13, 20, and 21, if you want to take notes, we're going to try to get through this in 40 minutes or so. So, uh, But it's going to be a lot of Bible stuff. So Hebrews 13, 20, and 21. Now may the God of peace who brought you up from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, may he equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So the God of peace, number one, he introduces himself as the God of peace. 
who brought us up from the dead. Do you know that you're currently raised from the dead? You've currently defeated death. It's a current thing. It's already happened. It says uh, that he's brought us up through by the great shepherd through the blood of the eternal covenant to equip us to do something. So you've been raised from the dead, and now you're equipped to do something with your life. That's exciting because there's a plan for you. This word equip, it's the same exact word in the Hebrews for men, for in the Hebrew, or actually in the Greek, for mending. So equipping and mending. Uh, this same exact word in the Strong's Dictionary was used in Matthew 4, 20 and 22. It said this. It says that Jesus, going on from there, when he saw two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, they were mending their nets. While they were mending their nets, he called them. Immediately after the call, they left their boat and their father and followed him. To mend the nets. Why would they want to mend the nets? Because there was something to do. They had kingdom business to attend to. And when God would send something into the, the nets that were damaged or destroyed by whatever, maybe life, maybe they've just been overused, abused, or whatever. Maybe it's just things have happened, but they're just ineffective nets because things fall through them. They were unable to bring in what God wanted them to bring in. So it makes sense to me that we would work towards equipping the church in a time where God is about to send more increase into the church. Does this make sense? To mend, it's to frame a structure, to repair, restore, it's to rearrange priorities. So you're reprioritizing your life. Sometimes the first thing in mending is you are ch shifting a value system. Like the things that used to be important are no longer important. Or maybe they're not as important as these other things that are important. So while the disciples were repairing, restoring, rearranging, reprioritizing, Jesus walks by and starts to call them into something. And then they had to leave current business to get into kingdom business. This is the tension we all feel, is we're working in our own discipleship. Because right now, like, there's a work that's happening in you, and then there's a work that's happening through you. That's the reality for all of us. Any given Sunday, someone could preach to me. Tonight, someone could preach to me. Like, there's things in my life that I need to hear God on, and I do. I, get, I go listen to sermons. I go, uh, I'm searching up conferences, like online. I'm trying to find a word on something. I'm reading books. I'm trying to be equipped for what I do. In the same way that I'm pouring out to you, others are pouring into me. There's no difference. So I've got that same reality happen in my life where there's a work happening in me where I'm hopefully growing and becoming a better leader growing and becoming a better father, growing, becoming a better husband and friend and all around good dude for others. Hopefully that's what's happening. Um, you know, and I'm not perfect. None of us are there, but there, that's a revelation to some of you. You're like, Brad, is it perfect? Yeah, not even close. But we're in a process of maturity. We're maturing together. Ephesians 4, 11 and 16, 11 through 16. It says that he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints. They, he didn't actually appoint people into pastoral leadership so that they could have Instagram followings and stuff. Like it's actually to equip, like this is my job. Um. It says, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith. So there's a piece that's about unity in there. It says, of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God so that we become a mature man. Say mature. To the measure of the stature which belongs in the fullness of Christ. And then the result of this maturing, it's verse 14 if you read this, Ephesians 4. It says, as a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, the craftiness of deceitful seeming. But in speaking the truth in love, we grow up in all aspects of him, 
who is the head, from whom the whole body, being fitted together and held together by every, what every joint supplies according to the proper working. See, there's a working and then there's a proper working. According to the proper working of each, in, each individual part, which causes the growth of the body for the building of, up of itself in love. I know it's a lot. I want to bring two things out of this. We believe in a five-fold ministry. I know that that's not news for some of you. It might be for others. Some are like, what? Uh, other people try to label you whatever. Like, this is, you're a teacher. You're an evangelist. You're a pastor. You're an apostle. You're a prophet. Like, we have these labels for us. I don't really get into that too much, just for me personally. There may be a time we might begin to operate a little more, I guess, visibly in offices. You know, But right now, it's like I believe God is transforming us into worshipers. He's transforming us into lovers of people. He's transforming us in holiness. There's some work that he's doing before we try to go get all cute with our titles. Um, an apostle receives blueprints from heaven. An apostle receives blueprints from heaven. A lot of times that's a founder, apostolic leader. It's somebody who goes and creates culture and raises up leaders. And in a lot of ways, I operate in that stream a lot. A prophet is someone who inspires the work. We know Haggai and Ezekiel and uh, all the prophets from the Old Testament. They would speak and things would begin to happen. This is why we won't stop our prayer ministry. Because I see prayer under that category where prayer is like speaking the life into the church and causing movement. You may not even realize it, but it's possible that our prayer ministry could be shaking open things in heaven that are falling into your lap. You don't even know it. So people go, man, I'm getting my prayers answered. God just loved me. Yeah, God loves you, but you also have people praying for you. <laughs> you also have things happening in prayer. Um, we know that Peter was in jail in Acts, but there was this house group praying, and they stayed in prayer, and they prayed all night. And then on the other side of this encounter, they didn't know. They probably took a break, went to the restroom, had dinner, ate some lamb. I don't know what they do in Jewish prayer meetings, but they had a prayer night. On the other side, in Peter's reality, an angel had walked into the prison an earthquake had happened, the cell doors had opened, and the whole entire house, the jailer included, began to be saved. And then Peter gets out, has the opportunity to walk out of jail. He's like, no, I'm not going to walk out of jail. We're going to go baptize people. Like the Philippian church was birthed, I believe, by the prayers of the people. And then this miraculous encounter from Peter, or with Peter from God. But what was interesting was after this prayer meeting, like at one of these places, and I might be getting a little bit of this because this is outside my notes, but there was this place, this prayer meeting was happened. Peter was released from jail. Peter shows up the door and knocks on the door of this prayer meeting. They wouldn't even open. This is real. Go read it. I don't know the passage. Look it up. Chat GPT it. Whatever you want to do. Uh, Peter comes out of his jail experience, knocks on the door, they don't open it. They actually open it, and they say, oh, it must be a, an angel. They say, it must be an angel, and they shut the door in his face. This is the way for some of us where, like, the answer to my prayer is staring at me, staring at me, and I don't even discern it. I don't realize it. But this is the prophetic work. The evangelist is sharing the good news. This is signs and wonders are attached to the preaching of the gospel where you go say, hey, let's just pray about your issue. And then you pray, and then they walk away, and something happens. They send you a testimony, and they go, "Woo! thank you, Jesus. Like, the rent's paid, and I didn't know where I was going to go or how it was going to happen, but a check came. That's the evangelist work. Pastors shepherd the people, and teachers strengthen the body. It's like installing truth strengthens the bolts in the structure. So what we're doing tonight is like tightening down the bolts so that the structure is strong. Um, in teaching, so that you understand my philosophy as a teacher, it's real simple, and it's not something I read in a book. Uh, it's something that I gathered by meeting with other pastors. Like, I believe in teaching, demonstrating, and activating. It's a very, very simple process. So teach the word, demonstrate the word, activate the word. So I don't always do this perfectly. I make mistakes, like many of you. Like, I, there's sometimes after I get done at church and I'm going, 
I gave this word, and I felt like that was God, but then I did nothing to activate it in the people. <laughs> and, I, and I walk away, and I go, dang it, I got to fix that next time. I, I, I process the same way as you. But, like, if we teach on prayer, I try to teach the scriptures on prayer. I demonstrate how prayer works, and then I activate opportunities for you to pray for yourself or pray, develop a lifestyle of prayer. Uh, salvation, I teach on salvation. I demonstrate the effects of salvation. I open up opportunities and hopefully invite you to receive salvation. The result of this five-fold leadership functioning in all these areas of the body, which we're growing in, we're not there, is that we are no longer storm-tossed. We are no longer carried away. I see a storm-tossed church, and it grieves me. We're carried away by the winds of everyone's opinion. Like, you find a new video, it carries you somewhere. You, oh, you got this new method, it carries you somewhere. The, the, the waves are the issues of life. The wind is the influence of man. And the current is the relational pool that prevents you from staying grounded in the word in spite of what's going on around you. This is equipping. This is why equipping is important. And this is why, just going to plug it because I, I think it's important, like, you should read your daily reading. If you're in ministry, or if you're not, if you're a parent, like a chapter a day. Even if it's just you read it and you don't understand what it's saying or whatever, but you go through the process of reading it and saying, Lord, speak to me. And then you receive it. And if you have questions, you ask someone, you text someone. But it's so important to get regular Bible teaching. Now, that's equipping. Laid a foundation for equipping. I want to talk about discerning spirits. Shanna says I have no discernment. <laughs> I discern that that's a lie. <laughs> I actually say I have discernment. I just also carry a ton of hope. <laughs> you know, so I have discernment, but I carry hope for change. You know what I'm saying? Um, are we at a place as a family where I can just, like, give you some stuff? Okay. Um, even if it, con even if, like, here's what I'm going to say. All right. I'm going to risk the offense. Here we go. Um, do you know that people you dearly love and have done life with for a long time can be influenced by the wrong spirit? Just because they're loyal friends doesn't mean they always give you godly counsel. Um, just because you've went in deep with people for a season and you've shared in circumstances and fellowship and all this. Do you know fellowship is an exchange of life? So like when someone goes through something and you meet them in their suffering, there's an exchange that takes place. There's a, the question is like what, who's exchanging what and how is it affecting who, right? So like people you love can be pulled into a political spirit. You can be pulled into a political spirit. And all of a sudden, you begin to see things that are different from the simplicity and purity of the gospel. Because like, it's about the simplicity and the purity of the gospel of Christ. You can be pulled into a religious spirit where you start to feel the pressure to conform and you get shame or you get certain things that are like, you know, someone said this about you in the church and like there's this pressure, right? This religious pressure. Like that can cause, um, that can influence you in the wrong way. Um, there's a spirit of fear. Spirit of fear will create insecurity. Romans 8.15, it says, For you have not received a spirit of fear leading to fear again, a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which you cry out, Abba, Father. A spirit of fear will always isolate you. It will prevent you from entering into relationships because maybe for good reason, like someone might hurt you. And you go, that hurts. I never want to feel that again. Don't you think Jesus wrestled with this tension? As he's eating dinner, knowing that Judas is about to betray him and he's about to endure the most horrific night of suffering we could imagine. But yet, what did he do? He ate dinner with him. He broke bread. He washed his feet. I could probably argue biblically that, like, even when you discern something in people, it's your responsibility 
with the gospel in mind, with the frame of the gospel, it's your responsibility to wash the feet of your enemies and those who would try to hurt you, not just deal with them or mute them. For some, you're influenced by rebellion. You have people in your life that are influenced by a spirit of rejection and rebellion. Um, the prophet Samuel said this. He said, "Is the Lord have as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as he does in obeying the voice of the Lord? Like there are some that are just caught up in rebellion. They don't want anybody telling them what to do. They don't want to submit to the church. Like church models are this and church models are that. Like there's this whole spirit of rebellion in a generation. And it says... The Bible says, it says, for rebellion, in verse 23 of 1 Samuel 15, it says, rebellion is as the sin of divination, and insubordination is the inequity of idolatry. It says, rebellion is the same as witchcraft. So if you don't submit to God, and you don't submit to the Word of God, you have no right, it's hypocritical to talk about how dark a psychic is. That's heavy. That's heavy, but it's the same thing. God says, I see rebellion the same as I see witchcraft. Same spirit. It's a spirit of rebellion. It's an antichrist spirit. You begin to partner with an antichrist spirit when you have a spirit of rebellion. Um, you, guys, you guys still with me? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to digress a little bit. It's important to have friends to talk through stuff with. Like, so you meet someone in their pain, like, it's important. I never want to stop that. Like, we need that. But we need to also walk with the fear of the Spirit of the Lord. Where we say, like, sharing a meal is good. Being someone that others can vent their pain on or their experiences on, that is good. Um, But what isn't good is allowing someone else's experience to reframe the way you see everything. So you have to be able to say, I empathize with you, and I'm sure that was painful, but also I realize that I don't know everything. I know what you're sharing with me. I don't know exactly how to walk through all of that with you, but here's what I do know is the Bible says, and the Bible says, and the Bible says, and I do think it would be healthy if you forgave them. I think it would be healthy if you forgave them. But I don't know if I'm ready. I've done this with several people. There's many people in this room that have come to me with, like, real bad church hurt. And I've said, you're going to need to, you don't have to do it now, but you're going to need to go through a process of forgiving them. And this process of forgiving them, it will take you through a road of speaking good about them. Whew, this is going to be hard. You're going to have to bless them. Ah, oh, that's going to be so tough for some of you. Um, Some people will draw you into their pain because you have empathy and you're a Christian. And some friends will draw you in, and you'll want to meet them there. But understand that um, this will bring relief to the pain. It's not going to heal the issue. It might bring a night of relief. It may feel good for three or four days. But it will. Jesus is the only one that heals Like, good friends can't do it. As much as I love good friends, they can't do it. It's Jesus working through the friends and the people that can heal our hearts. Um, There's, I, I, tonight, I wrote down eight people that are actively speaking against me. Eight people that I know, because I hear from other people, oh, so-and-so said this, and -and so-and-so said that. I'm like, I'm just so tired of this. Um, That's all I'll say. What I did, my response to this, was tonight I wrote down their names and I began to bless them and pray for them. And I said, Lord, I forgive them. And I want to pray for them until I feel genuine love for them in my heart. And I started to pray, Lord, would you surround them with great people? I don't want them to be lonely. I want them to have more. I want them to have experiences with you. Lord, would you meet them in prayer? And I called each person out by name. Lord, would you give them, fill their home with abundance, like laughter? Would you give them food in the cabinets, just overflow? Let them have dessert. I don't know, like just bless them. Let them have so many kids in the house and so much fun that it's just chaos. 
Like, let it be awesome. That's like blessing and a curse a little bit, you know. But <laughs> no, but you're like thinking about them, and you're like genuinely asking God to bless them. Lord, I pray that you heal them if they're sick. I ask, Lord, if they're going through any medical challenges right now, that you would speak into them. Like, I'm literally praying for these people one by one, over and over and over again. I'm praying for them, and I will not mention their name, and I will not speak bad about them. I will bless them, and many people will never even know. But I know because I have discernment. Um, there you go. <laughs> Romans 12. <laughs> Romans 12. Um, it says this. There, I had one guy one time. This, this is crazy. I had one guy call me for coffee. This is the kind of crazy stuff that happens in my life. Went to a church that all of you would know. It was a leader at another church that all of you would know. Called me and asked me to go to coffee for coffee. He's like, hey, bro, just want to go to coffee? And I'm like, I love this connection with pastors. This is going to be amazing. And I go, and we have coffee on my deck. And it was incredible. And uh, it was a long time ago. I was still working for the rescue mission or whatever. But we're getting this started and everything. And um, we talked church planting. We talked kids. We talked family life. We talked just ministry and stuff. It was beautiful. And then I said, all right, man. I said, well, I got to go to work. It's, Thank you so much for this. He goes, well, actually, he goes, I uh, actually wanted to talk to you about something. I'm going, oh, gosh. We just talked for an hour and a half. But now the hammer's going to drop. He said, um, we were told that you don't believe in the Trinity, and um, if that's true, my pastor is going to send an email to every pastor in the county and let them know that you're a false teacher. And so um, I just wanted to ask you, like, you know, is what we heard true? And I'm like, what in the – I almost cussed. I'm like, what is going on? Where did you hear that? Like, like – I have no clue. There was, like, ammunition, like, aimed at me, and I'm like, welcome to Ventura. <laughs> Whew. I said, I have no clue what you're talking about, man. Have you ever listened to me preach? You heard me talk about the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit? I probably believe in the Holy Spirit. Like, I could argue you theologically because <laughs> your church may or may not be reformed, doesn't believe in the Trinity because you don't talk about the Holy Spirit, but let's not even go there, all right? Um, anyways, like, Bless you. Bless you, my brother. Um, no, I literally did. Bless you. In my heart, though, I'm thinking, you drank my coffee? You sat on my dick? I'm late to work? I was so mad. I'm like, brother, I know that you have this. I was like, thank you, man. No, I totally believe in the Trinity, and I can give you a full report on my beliefs if you want me to send you some scriptures and stuff. And I actually did. I sent him some scriptures and what I believed, and let it go. <sighs> thank you. You can applaud that, because that was rough, man. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just messing with you guys. Oh. Romans, why? Why, though? I mean, I just did this recently. I had a, two people that um, were, like, doing some not-so-great things that I just simply, like, did something good for them because of Romans 12. Bless those who persecute you, verse 14. Bless and do not curse. Like, don't curse them. Never pay back evil for evil with anyone. Hello. Sit in that. Let that penetrate. Never pay back evil for evil for anyone. We live in this world where they want us to have an eye for an eye. Like, I've got to retaliate. I've got to say something. I've got to post in response. Like, and I do sometimes. I'm not perfect, but it says don't do it. It says respect what is right in the sight of all men. And if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. So as it depends on you, be at peace. It says if your enemy is hungry, feed him. So don't just tolerate him. Send him DoorDash. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you'll burn his head with coals. No, that, I don't like that part of it, but it is in the Bible, so I have to say it. Um, but this is the part that I, I centered in on recently and that I try to live by. It says, don't overcome. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The person with the most influence in any room is the person who does the most good. 
So I just try to stay focused on the good. Stay focused on the good. Um, what's my response to the critics? Um, I'm just going to focus on the good. I'm not really going to respond. I'm just going to keep loving people, keep delivering people, keep preaching, keep discipling, keep doing our work. I can't go and fight every battle. Um, 1 John 4 1 it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This test is to examine the material quality of, of an interaction. So like you're examining not the person, the quality of what's going on. Like you're able to dissect the words because the words reveal the heart. And it begins to give you a window into what's happening behind what's being said. Um, 1 Corinthians 12, 6 through 11, I'm not going to read it, but it says that God has given the Spirit to work through all persons. And he's given a manifestation of the Spirit for good, for the common good. So discernment is for good. So it's not just to warn you, to send warning lights on. Like I could send alarms in everyone's mind all the time, but my job is to bring good to the church. It says that along with all these other gifts listed, it says that he's given the discerning, the distinguishing of spirits. This discernment is a judicial rendering of a decision. That may sound like judgment, and it is, but you're not judging the person. You're judging the spirit. Do you hear me? So, like, this isn't saying, now I'm going to label you. This is who you are. This is labeling the source of what's happening through the person. Right? Where you go, ooh, that feels like an identity thing. That feels like an orphan thing. That feels like fear. That feels like you're, you're sensing something. Does this make sense? 2 Corinthians 5.16. I'm just going to fly through this because we're, I was, I, I, there's a lot of scripture. But um, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, Paul said. So we don't see people according to the flesh anymore. Even though we have no, even though we have known, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, we see Him no longer this way either. We see Christ in spirit. John three three, Jesus said, "Truly, truly, unless someone is born again, he can't see the kingdom." So, like, you can't see kingdom things until you're born of the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is born inside of you, you now are able to see things like my daughter Drew in her Oculus. Do you know what an Oculus is? Okay. No, it's not a drawing thing. No. Um, wrong. Uh, no. They make them. Like they, they're, they put, you put them on and you're in a 3D world. As soon as you put them on, like I've, I, play this like shooter game. I was murdering people in this the other day. And like, no, literally murdering everybody. And, uh, but you're in this world, but I'm sitting in the living room and I could show you a picture. Like I'm in the living room going pew, 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 with this mask on, right? I'm in he digital places in a physical world. And that same way, when you're born again in the spirit, you have access to see spiritual things in a physical world. Does this make sense? Like watching a broadcast on your device or in your living room. You're able to spiritually view through the lens of discernment the interactions of your relationships where you say, oh, that channel being broadcast is the channel of trauma. Oh, I know. If I go to that channel until it's changed, until it's healed, until something is different about that relationship, they're always going to have, they're going to be broadcasting from that pain. I can go on and on and on. Ephesians 2.2, 2, it says that you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the broadcast, of the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Think about this. So he didn't say, the strangers of disobedience. He said the sons of disobedience. So there's a chance that people that are want, were once called in right identity with God, and because Matthew 13 tells us that not every 
soil of the heart that receives the word of God is going to bear fruit. So because there will be problems in life, some, it says in the first parable, it says that some seed is sown beside the road and the birds come. That's like the birds represent thoughts, exterior thoughts that enter your mind and carry away the seed. The birds are thoughts. And like sometimes we just have birds fly into our mind and we forget what God said and we move on. The, the next is um, identity. It said it had no firm root. So because it had no firm root, it was carried away. The third, it says that the worries of the world choked the word, so it became unfruitful. We know for reasons that some can be born again and may be going to heaven, but also may be operating in a spirit of disobedience. We know this. That's Bible. It's not Brad. Um, I used to teach the sermon as I saw it was like the, uh, the immune system of the body or the nervous system of the body, like the nervous system. It causes you to feel, see, touch, smell, right? Um, And feel. It says, so like when you feel something is off spiritually, there's a spiritual sense within you called discernment. When you say it doesn't feel peaceful, I walk into some home, like I'll just use them as an example. So like Ricky and Katie, I walk into their home and it feels peaceful. Like you can tell that those people pray. Walk into their house and like even if, I don't think that they have a perfect night every night of the week, but there's a substance of peace. Katie's like, huh, uh, let me tell you, kids are crazy. Like, there's peace in the homes. There's several of you. I go to your house. There's peace in the home. You sense it. There's not chaos. Things aren't out of order. You have, it's okay to have a bad day. It's okay to have a bad month. Like, but in reality, there's, but the, but the, the underlying foundation of the home is peace. There's times when me and Shannon go through it, and I'll just wait till everybody goes to bed, and I'll walk through, and I'll just go, I speak peace into my home. I speak the peace of God into my home. I cast down every lie. I cast down the issues we faced this week. I cast down the worry. I cast all the stuff, and I just release peace in my home. So peace, you live here. And I just speak it out, right? And then hopefully my girls wake up in the morning, and there's peace in the home. Um, When you start to see what's going on behind what's going on, it's you stop being angry at the people. Like today, if I showed up, if after this you went, well, you just had food, but if you, let's just say I saw you this weekend and you're at your favorite Mexican restaurant, and I walk up, I'm like, hey, good to see you guys. I walk up and I throw your rice and beans in your face. <laughs> like, are you going to be mad at the rice and beans? <laughs> No, right? You're going to pray for me like, oh, man. You would not be mad at what's being thrown at you. You'd be mad at the source, the one that brought the, brought the change, right? You'd be mad at what's sourcing the conflict. Do you know the devil is throwing things in your face every week? The devil's throwing stuff in your face every week, every day, in form of potentially relationships that you love. This is why it's important not to react or overreact one way or the other, to what's happening, but to spend a lot of time in prayer and cultivate a heart of peace and saturate your life and nourish your life with the word and understand what healthy is. So we're going to see Hebrews 5.14. It says solid food is for the mature. Remember, we talked about maturity. This is the goal. It says solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. This word senses is interesting. It was like a revelation for me. It's actually um, an organ of perception, like in the human body. In the same way your lungs have a purpose, your heart has a purpose, your, your uh, kidneys have a purpose, and your liver has a purpose. Discernment is placed in the body as an organ of perception. And when you have a healthy diet of truth and someone tries to feed you a lie or pull you into something dark, you have this organ within the spiritual body that processes what is good and regurgitates a blessing. And you say, I can bless you doesn't mean I have to be with you. I can go to lunch with you, but I don't have to partner with you. Um, And in some ways, the Bible, if I'm being honest, there's been times where God's told me, don't eat with that person. I've had friends, literally. I had a a group of friends that were living a life of compromise real early in our faith. 
And I was so grieved by it. I was hungry for the Lord, and I was trying to get out of my own stuff. And I was like, Lord, when I'm with them, I'm getting pulled into this stuff, and I just don't like it, and I don't like what's happening. And he goes, 1 Corinthians 5.9. I was like, boom. I didn't know 1 Corinthians 5.9. I was maybe saved a year and a half, two years. And I went and looked it up, and I said, I tell you not to associate with immoral people. Like he said, come out from among them. And I literally had to change relationships because of their compromise. And you know what I did was I said, they said, so you mean we're not Christian enough for you? I said, you could interpret it however you want to interpret it, but God is calling me here. If you want to meet me, I'll be at church. That's the reality. Um, Get through this. got a bunch of personal stories, but I want to stay in the Word, and I want to get in this. There was, um, gosh, where did I land on this? Um, Ten years ago, we were going through some intense relational challenges, and I couldn't quite find the source of it. We were like, Lord, what is going on? Like, it seems like everything here was good, like at least in my church life, everything was good with the people, a lot of ministry happening, so much fruit, things were aligning, but just out of nowhere, like it would seem like issues would just come and try to like pull our confidence from us, our spiritual confidence from us and get feedback and criticism. And this is why it's important for me, like even for you guys as leaders, understand that like I do take feedback seriously And we will talk about things if it's good feedback. But what I'm not going to do is be led by opinions of low people with low commitment and make the lives of the people who have given their lives for this thing crazy because someone on the outside had an opinion about the way that they live or serve or whatever. So, like, it's very important to me to back up our leaders. You know, so I do back up our leaders. So, like, when someone says something about Parker, I go, that's probably true, I'm sure. <laughs> no, but uh, I, I had this season where um, it was like I just did not feel confident in leadership at all because I was so afraid that, like, I couldn't figure out, like, who is talking and what are they saying? Because my, right now there's, I'm having an intense relationship with my pastor, if I'll be honest. It was, like, just not great. And... Um, a friend of mine who was a real estate agent, he called me and it, one day, and he just goes, Brad, he goes, hey, he goes, I, uh, he said, my wife had a dream, and she's like a prophetic person. She had a dream, and she, uh, she said she has to tell you. She feels like it's from God. It was super vivid and real, and she said, can I put her on the phone? I was like, for sure. And so she said, hey, Brad, um, last night I had this really intense dream, and you were walking me through this house. And, like, you were showing me all these beautiful things. You're like, check out this room and check out that room. And this happens over here and that happens over there. She says, and then you walked me to this back room and you opened the door and there was this paper mache pink wolf. And you go, that's our pink wolf. Um, it comes to life when we least expect it. And she woke up. I was like, okay. She goes, I don't know what you're going to do with that. I'm just going to tell you I had this dream And uh, she said, and right as you shut the door, it began to come to life. I carried that for a while. I'm like, what is this? What is this? Through a period of time, I started to see, like, I had a problem. Like, there there was a woman who was speaking against us. And it became, like, a, it became a thing. And this person was, to my face, saying really nice things. Would not, I mean, was not real to me at all. And behind the surface was just feeding negativity to my pastor. But God had saw it, and he showed me. He said, hey, um, when you least expect it, this thing comes to life. And I couldn't discern what was going on. It was freaking me out. And it was interesting. It's like in our ministry, like we started out like empowering women, empowering women. And like uh, I believe in empowering women leadership. Don't hear anything else from what I'm saying. I believe in this, and I will continue to do this. Uh, We have women pastors at this church. I know that some people think that's controversial. Uh, I don't. 
Uh, there's no discrimination in gifting in the body of Christ. Uh, anything the Bible speaks about order, it's in household relationships. And it's not even about, it says like, so if a man wants to lead, he has to die. So like, if you, and, and also, by the way, it says lead like Christ. And so for men, like, if you want to lead like Christ, give all your authority away to her, the church. So understand that that's like the model. The model is like, if I'm going to carry a lot of authority, you know what I have to do? I have to give it to her, the church, the body of Christ, feminine noun, just so you know. Um, so you need to create a space. And also, by the way, I wouldn't go to somebody's house if they're like, hey, great to meet you. I'm going to do all the talking. My wife's going to sit there, shut up, and serve, all right? Like, I just don't think that that's healthy. That would not be a healthy marriage. That would, I would be like, I'd be like, I would say like, Blink twice if there's a problem right now. Like, do something to tell me. Like, um, and I could get, this is not a preaching on, like, women in leadership. I just had to say it. But I had to say it because of this. Like, I think we've come a long way in healthy masculinity. But I also think, like, just pastorally, I'm going to ask some of the ladies, too. It's like, don't let gossip spread through you. Don't give in to it. It's venom. And it feels good. It's like a drug. But if you distribute it, you're a drug dealer. You know, um, I think we need a season of healthy feminism, too, you know, where there's honor among both. Um, we had somebody two months ago give us a word. And it, it, she did it in front of everybody. It was at our prayer meeting two, uh, two Wednesday prayer things ago in the main building or in the other building. She said, I feel like. I got a strong word or whatever, and, and, and she said, I don't think I should share it here. I go, just share it. Ladies can speak freely here. Like, just share it, whatever. She goes, the Lord just told me there's a Jezebel spirit coming after the church. I was like, maybe you shouldn't speak freely. I want to be honest with you. Like, like, maybe we shouldn't just speak freely. And uh, I didn't quite, I was like, I received that. And, like, I think when we hear something like that, we think immorality like, that's what you think, and there is a component of that in there. Um, and I think there is a Jezebel spirit going after men. Like, I think that there's an assignment against men to, um, to take their authority from them, really, through immorality. But the following day, uh, Ashley Nettles, who uh, works with us, she uh, called me, and she said, this morning, she goes, that word was on my heart. And I was going, God, are you? what are you saying with this? And she opened her devotional for work and it was about the Jezebel spirit, but it said, so it was like God was confirming it, but she sent me a picture of it and it said, Jezebel needs Ahab in order to function. So she needs to be able to run over a guy in order to function. So when uh, the man doesn't demonstrate strong leadership, this, not the person, Spirits. Remember, we're talking about spirits. We're not talking about people. We are not talking about people. We're talking about spirits. Don't interpret this the wrong way. When the man isn't leading and hearing God in his own way, in his own lane, what happens is this spirit sees an opportunity to begin with a spirit of control. To begin with a spirit of control and undermine the work of the prophets. We've seen this a lot in our ministry. This is just a discernment piece. This is all I'm going to say, and I'm speaking against it because it's a lie. Like, and, and I'm never going to stop empowering women. And I'm not going to let the devil put fear in my mind that, oh, okay, so gossip's going to do this and gossip's going to do that. I'm just going to end it in the name of Jesus. We just right now, let's call that down. In the name of Jesus... We cast down a Jezebel spirit. We don't accept it. And as a leadership team, we give it no space here. In Jesus' name, amen. Mika called me the other day or texted me and she said, I had this vivid, vivid dream. And this is part of where I started getting a lot of this stuff about um, discernment too. She said, uh, I was driving along the 101, and I shared this in another setting. I didn't do it at church, so if you heard it twice, I apologize. I'll be quick. She said, I was driving down the 101, and she said, and I'm gonna, if I mess it up, you can talk to her. She'll give you the right version. I'll give you my version. This is what I heard. And so she said she was driving down the 101. She looked on the beach, and there were like hundreds of little toy dragons, 
like long tails, jumping, like dragons kids would play with, like toy dragons. She said that she's driving, and she's looking, and she's like, oh, that's cute. She says, then all of a sudden, all these dragons turn towards the ocean. And she said they started going out in the ocean. She said the deeper they went out into the ocean, they started to go towards these surfers that were waiting on this wave. She said the deeper they went out into the ocean, the more they grew, and the tails grew, and wings began to expand. And these dragons became very scary from what I was depicting was like medievalish dragons. She said, and right about the time the surfers discerned that someone was coming, the wings sucked into their backs, and they became humans. The, and um, she said that the surfers received them and were interacting with them, and she's yelling from the freeway or from the beach, she's yelling, look behind what's happening. Look what's behind them. Look what's behind them. And um, I, it, was, it was cool because one of the last things she said, it like really hit me and I knew it was from God. But she, she said, I just think with all these wave words and revival wave stuff and everybody's waiting on this wave that's coming, she, I just think you need to know there's something else in the water. Ephesians 6.12, it says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. It's not against people. It's against spirits. David was in a cave running for his life. Saul was haunted by the ghost of David haunted by the ghost of David. And um, Saul was consumed with diminishing his influence. Every time he'd have a conversation, it was about killing David, killing David. i got to end David. And his son Jonathan, he said, if we don't kill David, you're never going to have an inheritance, on and on and on. He had this consuming spirit with David. Um, David had an opportunity to retaliate and take it back into his hands. His guys counseled him to do it. David had opportunity. David chose not to. Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. David had opportunity. David chose not to. Saul leaves, and he goes back to his army. But David can't really stomach what had happened. He said, I've got to go out. And so David runs out of the cave, and he falls on the ground with the robe in his hand that he had cut. And he said, my father, Saul, he said, don't listen to these voices that I'm trying to kill you. I'm not trying to kill you. I'm not trying to hurt you. David's not doing anything against you. I'm not trying to hurt you. These are wrong voices. And it says that Saul, when he saw David in the flesh, and David had appealed to him like a father and humbled himself and just said, I'm sorry. It says that Saul turned and goes, this is, is that you, David, my son? It was no longer Dave, the haunting, David, the haunted spirit. It was David, the son. He saw him as a son again, so it reframed it whenever he came in humility, and he apologized. And um, Saul said, you're more righteous than me. I spent my time consumed with you, and all you're doing is blessing me and letting me go and releasing me. This is reconciliation. Um, man, there's so much more I want to talk about. Maybe I can get into it Sunday. I don't know. Maybe not, but... We can do another one of these. I want to keep you here all night because I want to close. But sometimes you, you have to seek reconciliation. Even though you may discern there's an issue or whatever, it's like the way we win is by loving one another. I can't get into it all, but I had a whole piece on reconciliation. Like um, 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says, We are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. 2 Corinthians 5.19, it says that now he has committed us to the word of reconciliation. Colossians 1.20, he's reconciled all things to himself, having made peace by the blood of his cross. Reconciliation is a relational exchange where you're seeking peace and you're exchanging, like exchanging coins. You say, I was hurt. So let's talk through this. You were hurt. We had a misunderstanding. You talk. There's an exchange happening. Insubordination and rebellion or irreconcilable differences, you're not willing to go into a process of exchange and vulnerability. So in the last days, 2 Timothy is way in here. I'm just going to abbreviate it. 2 Timothy, God said, in the last days, people will be irreconcilable. 
they'll live with deep, deep, deep offense. And there's nothing you can do about it because they just are an offended generation. So they won't even come to the table and seek reconciliation. So in that, do everything you can, and then you have to release it. You have to say, you know what? I love you, and I bless you, and I will not speak against you. Um, that's how you, and, and, and the reason why you do this, Jesus told us, he said, check this out. Matthew, I have to say this. Matthew 18, 15, eight, three more minutes. It'll be worth your time. Matthew 18, 15 through 18, it says, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. And if he listens to you, you've won your brother. If he doesn't listen to you, take two or more people and go, because by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact to be confirmed. So, like, you need two or three witnesses on things. Bring them with you. Um, it says, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen to the church, let them be as a Gentile or a tax collector, meaning release them. 18, it says, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Why did Jesus connect binding and loosing to forgiveness and restoration? Why did he connect binding and loosing to reconciliation? Because it actually can stop, because relational conflict can stop the flow of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30, it says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you're sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander be put away from you. And be kind to one another and tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as Christ has also forgave you. Because it actually stops the flow of the Holy Spirit. It grieves the Holy Spirit when we walk with a hardened heart. Like, I, I, I will sometimes lose in a relationship because I know that fighting that battle will harden me. Defending myself will harden me. It'll sharpen my sword, and I don't want a sharp sword in that area. I'd rather just die. I'd rather not fight for myself. I'd rather not try to go and defend myself in anything, you know, and for some of us, like, it's okay, like, when you're in ministry, right, and you're in leadership in your own home, in your own life, all over the place, right, some of you do lots of different things, it's okay to be misunderstood, you don't have to have an answer for everything, you can say, I'm so sorry you feel that way, and bless them, and pray for them, and truly empathize with what's going on, while also maintaining course, because you're not going to be moved by the winds of opinions. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that in ministry leadership, you're going to have to become a person who's stormproof. Part of that is not just, because we have the experiences of life and leadership and faith and whatever, like we have these experiences also understand that like discerning what's going on behind it will help you see through the issues and access another world where you can get spiritual strength in the middle of your storm. Um, I'm just going to pray for you guys, so let's stand. Time's up. We'll, uh, we'll do another one of these, but it, uh, I've got more scriptures I'll probably, I can send out an email or something with you guys with all the verses and stuff and more if you want that. Lord, I know this probably felt like it's just another church service, but the heart of it's very, very, very different. This is intentional equipping in the body. And today in this season, you've chosen me to do this thing. But as this grows, there's going to be more and more people you're going to call into leadership. that are going to be responsible for teaching and instilling identity and doing all the things that make this healthy. So, Lord, just right now, I ask for reconciliation in relationships. I release a ministry of reconciliation. You don't have to go chase down people that are hurt. But reconciliation is reconciling people to the Father. It's reconciling people to the Father. Ephesians. Or no, where is it? It's one of these verses. Um, Colossians 1.20, it says, Through him Jesus reconciled all things to himself through the blood of the cross. So Lord, we want the world to know who you are and who they are in a ministry of reconciliation. 
We don't want to be hostile towards you anymore. We don't want to grieve you, Holy Spirit. We want to genuinely walk with empathy and understanding. And also, Lord, we want to have clear discernment so we can discern the truth from the lie. 1 Corinthians 13 says that love doesn't rejoice in what's wrong. So we don't go celebrate something that's dark, but we also don't condemn the people. So Lord, I ask two things. Number one, for a ministry of reconciliation to be released in our church, that we would help people see another perspective, a kingdom perspective, the truth of the scriptures, that we'd be people that are carriers of hope, implanters of truth, that when we sit down with a student or a person who's suicidal or angry or ready to make a bad decision, that we'll be able to step back from the emotions of it and not get drawn in and go, here's the truth, and like deliver truth. So I pray for that, and I also pray, Lord, for anyone that may speak against this ministry, Lord, we ask sincerely that you would bless their life. I pray, Lord, that you would fulfill dreams, that you would surround them with family. And Lord, I thank you that our leadership team is growing stronger and stronger. And the core, so this is not just leaders within our body. These, this is the core of our ministry, that our core is getting stronger and being strengthened every day. And Lord, what you're preparing us for is beyond our wildest dreams a season of flourishing, a season where we're just caught up in you, Lord. I long for this season. You know, that's my personal prayer. I'm saying, God, would you handle all the financial stuff and all this, like, so I can move past all this and just get lost in you? That's my hope, is that when we enter 117 and get done with the construction, that I can just get lost. It's like David. It's like one thing I ask and one thing I seek is that I'll be in the house of the Lord. So, Lord, thank you for bringing us together. I ask for a fresh wind right now. Holy Spirit, breathe on every ministry, every person, every family, every couple, every student, every business owner, every spouse, every single person, whether you're in audio, video ministry, whether you're creative, whether you, it doesn't matter what you do. Right now, Holy Spirit, whether you serve, would you breathe life into the vision? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Love you guys so much. Hopefully it's worth your time. I'll send some stuff out, and we'll see you soon.